Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's critique of Noam Chomsky from their A Thousand Plateaus, specifically the chapter titled uh, The Postulates of Linguistics. And I thought this would be appropriate. Last week I did the whole Chomsky thing, so let's just continue down that route. Now before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you go and check out my like 300 episodes I already have up. If you're interested in that, you can subscribe and see videos I release every single week, sometimes twice a week. If you found this in a podcast platform, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube if you're into that. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it on a podcast platform where it'll just be audio. And I hope my voice is soothing enough to help you uh, maybe at least fall asleep if you need help with that, you know? But yeah, do all those things, subscribe, it'll help me out a lot. And uh, well, yeah, without further ado, let's covered Deleuze and Guattari's critique of Noam Chomsky's linguistic theories. So this is coming out of the chapter, The Postulates of Linguistics from a Thousand Plateaus. Now I've covered the whole book on this channel, and if you are interested in that, you can go and listen to the ep- many episodes I've done on that. But for now, I just want to talk about the issue that Deleuze and Guattari have with Chomsky's linguistic theories, which I'll cover here. Now, in their chapter, they stage an engagement or kind of dialogue between Noam Chomsky and another linguist named William Labov. And to put it really simply, Chomsky's idea is that all languages have universal invariants that do not change from language to language or within languages. And these are fundamental principles that guide all languages, be they syntactical codes, be it the organization of sentences. So in English, you have subject, verb, noun. So David walks to the beach would be a standard English sentence. That is David being the subject, walks is the verb that the subject is doing to the beach, the beach being the area or the noun. And so in this case, there are there are other elements to it as well, but just within English, for example, that is just one potentially universal element of the language as being a sign of proper English. So Chomsky's project is unraveling these, trying to find out what these universals are. Now Labov, might be pronounced Labov, but Labov, in any case, on the other hand, suggests that there are no universals within language, and instead, what there are are variations. And these variations are really the only guiding universal principle that we can actually discern from languages. So to put it within Deleuze and Guattari's own language, they suggest that Chomsky's approach is tantamount to the arborescent approach to language, whereas Labov's is more of a rhizomatic approach. Now, I say that, I'm going to problematize it a little bit, but the idea here is that for Chomsky, he's trying to reduce all differences to a similar universal system. And they use the image of a tree here to really convey that, hence arborescence, referring to trees, tree-like structures. Whereas Labov, belonging to a more rhizomatic type of thought, is more prepared to find differing forms of connections that guide any kind of language and that we can use to understand how languages really work. So his approach is more tantamount to, not a tree really, but like a root system that is quite unpredictable and that it is going to really flow into directions that are difficult to capture, difficult to trace, difficult to understand, and that will therefore evade any kind of homogenizing, universal approach to understanding them. So Chomsky belongs to that arborescent tradition, whereas Labov belongs to the rhizomatic one. Now again, we're going to problematize this in a little bit, but just for now, let's think of them in these terms. So Deleuze and Guattari aren't totally satisfied with either approach. They very much prefer Labov. They, they think that that, like Chomsky's really out of his element, and they really prefer what Labov suggests in terms of there not being any real true universal to language, unless that universal is the fact that there is no universal, that variation is what is language. 
So their problem with Chomsky is not that his approach is too far removed from reality, that trying to find a universal principle is just totally impossible because it doesn't exist. Their approach isn't to try to find out what really is true about language, because that would be to just replicate Chomsky's project, to try to supplant it with another universal schematic. Instead, what they want to try to do is push Chomsky's thought to its logical conclusion. And the reason for that is that within Chomsky's own linguistic work, he considers variations within language. So he'll consider dialects, he'll consider slang, he'll consider all of these things that break away from any traditional structures that a major language might have, be it English, let's just say English for now, uh, any real structure or code that English has. Chomsky will consider these, but he always relates them as being somewhat derivative to a real type of language, the real structural form of that language. So Deleuze and Guattari suggest then that the point of Chomsky's work really is to demonstrate the extent to which that these dialects, these derivations, these languages that are derivative to primary or majority languages are actually necessary to de define what a major language is. So if there weren't these oppositional dialects that fell outside of the purview of standard English, for example, then what we'd have is not a one major language that guides all other languages, Instead, we would have just nothing, because the only way to establish a major language is to have a necessary antithesis, so the opposite, against which to measure that language. So in order to set up for there to even have been a major standard language that has these apparent universals, it was necessary, or it is necessary, to have other forms of language within that language that can be seen as being non-standard and that can be compared to, to validate that primary language, that major language as being the universal one. But how does one language actually become that universal one, stand in for all the trueness of a language? Well, one way to really think about this, and Deleuze and Guattari are really guilty of this as well, is the distinction between French spoken in France and French spoken in Quebec, in Quebec, in Canada, which is where I am, hence my example. And the same can apply to French spoken in Algeria or French spoken in Haiti and so on. In A Thousand Plateaus, there's this point when Deleuze and Guattari suggests that French spoken in Quebec is like somehow more musical or more, almost like more childlike than French spoken in France, which is, it's, it's absurd. It's an absurd thing to say. But what they're doing here, and this is a problem in their work, I find, is that they're actually replicating the same problems that they raised with Chomsky to suggest that there is this, kind of tacitly suggest that there is this original true French and everything else is special in some way, being more musically inclined, being more infantile, not having the same kind of attachment to the major French language. Now this comes to be through power. And it comes to be through other historical developments that come to appreciate one kind of dialectic over others. So over time, in the case of France, what actually happened was that different villages, which actually spoke totally different languages, began to be subsumed under the category of French national identity, which was mostly a Parisian national identity, Paris the city, which was starting to really expand out via various new forms of communication and travel, the introduction of railroads, highways, the radio, television, that began to spread one kind of way to speak French all throughout France. And over time, the type of French that is spoken in Paris and in some parts of France is then taken to be the primary original form of French and everything else, any anything that is derivative to it, that sounds different, will be seen as being a dialect. 
It'll be labeled as an accent or slang, and it will therefore be something that is seen as derivative to that primary language, which in itself has no characteristics that fundamentally make it primary or more real or more true than any other form of that language, but it is something that is bestowed upon that language through histories. And colonialism, of course, can't be ignored in this, where language is imposed upon a certain people. Now, another important aspect to all of this within Deleuze and Guattari's work is to suggest that language extends much further than the act of speaking. And I mean, this is always at play when you just talk with somebody else. I mean, body language is a huge part of anyone's language. And there are going to be huge variations between cultures. For example, there are some indigenous writers within Canada. And here I'm thinking of Thomas King's book, Indigenous writer in Canada, in colonial Canada, titled Green Grass Running Water, in which there's this moment where two of the characters are crossing the border from Canada, and, or from the United States into Canada, and the border patrol person is smiling. But to the indigenous characters actually in the book, smiling because it, the way that, you know, North Americans do it, means showing your teeth, which is actually a sign of aggression. So even at the level of bodily expression, there are no universals. Different cultures are going to have different perceptions about different bodily forms of communication than others. And there's another really cool book, it's called How Emotions Are Made, uh, that, that studies this phenomenon. How different cultures have different perceptions of smiling, of crying, of anger. How they internalize these messages, these languages differently uh, than other cultures and other people. So the primary thesis here for Deleuze and Guattari is that there are no languages per se, there are only dialects. And it is only through time and through the establishment of various powerful hierarchies that come to establish certain languages, cer certain languages and certain dialects within any given language as being original and primary and the standard against which all other dialects are measured. And Chomsky is just victim to this. Chomsky just understands all languages as being measured in accordance with what is the dominant form of that language, like measuring how people in Haiti speak French compared to how people in France speak French, as though French-speaking French people in France are somehow more legitimate than French-speaking people in Haiti, or Spanish-speaking people in Mexico as being less legitimate than Spanish-speaking people in Spain. And again, it's important not to even homogenize these other dialects or any dialect. And it is important to acknowledge that even within anyone's given dialect, we put on many different masks when we discuss with anyone, when we talk to anybody, when we engage with anyone. When I go to the grocery store, I'm a different linguistic person than when I'm at, uh, when I'm in a, a conference at a, at a university or when I talk to all of you. I talk incredibly differently. All of my mannerisms will change. The inflections in my voice will change. And I'm speaking the same language in all of these settings. So the point here is to acknowledge that following Deleuze and Guattari's primary thesis of a thousand plateaus, we are all multiple. And every language is multiple without any one of them being more primary than any other.